In 1689, John Locke publishes his two treatises of government, in which he argues that because we're all a product of God's will, infringing upon another person's life, liberty and property opposes divine wisdom. Governments then should protect the rights of each, even against their own rulers. Locke argues for rights philosophically. In 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Contract had a similar effect in France. The American Revolution happens in 1776, the new constitution is directly influenced by Locke's thought. In France, the revolution occurs 13 years later in 1789 and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen is ratified in the same year. Both revolutions set the groundwork for legal and political rights. The following century is a turbulent one. Whose rights? Women's? Slaves? Foreigners? One of these questions begins to be answered with the American Civil War and the abolition of slavery. Colonies' rights to self-determination are increasingly questioned and the suffrage movement secures women's rights in many places at the end of World War I. We start then to see an increase in civic rights. It takes, though, until the catastrophe of the Second World War and the tragedy of the Holocaust for the United Nations to be formed and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to be secured in 1948. And this closes the story of human salvation with a happy ending. If the story really was this simple, we might not have such a gap between the signing of the Universal Declaration in 1948 and the eruption of interest in international human rights in the 70s. It was between the 70s and the 90s that a real discussion of human rights became prominent in the media. What explains this? Considering the rights of man were declared by some very powerful figures some 200 years earlier, why did it take until 1977, for example, for Amnesty International to win the Nobel Prize? The Human Rights Project seems like the ultimate philosophical enterprise. Philosophy is concerned with universals, and human rights seek to break down borders and unite a universal humankind. It's an explicitly utopian project. The traditional view might be said to be a teleological one. A teleological view proposes that there is an end to reach, that history progresses neatly in a line towards a goal, and for some, a utopia. The truth of history, of course, is much messier. Historian Samuel Moyne argues that rather than looking at the story of human rights teleologically, as a gradual unfolding of philosophy, of the French and American revolutions, of the abolition of slavery, the anti-colonial movement and humanistic reactions to the Holocaust, the catalyst for human rights came not neatly out of a story of increasing freedom, but out of a much more recent moment of contingent dismay and failure. It arose out of the collapse of two competing ideas of utopia, the American one, the American dream, perfect liberal freedom, and the communist one, the end of the class struggle and the end of history. The signing of the universal rights of man and the birth of the United Nations was overshadowed by the Cold War. By the 1970s, though, three important things had happened. The brutal repression of the Prague Spring by the Soviets ended any hope many supporters of communism in the West had that the USSR would reform. Leftists in the West were beginning to abandon their support for a communist project that they hoped would change in the post-Stalin era. But at the same time, the US was supporting murderous dictatorships in South America and helping overthrow democratically elected governments. Furthermore, welfare state social democracies across Europe were starting to crack. Unemployment was rising, strikes were common, inflation soared. Failure, it seemed, was everywhere. <laughs> 
It was in the midst of this period that human rights language, already used without much fanfare by NGOs and the UN, started to be adopted by social movements. A moment of desperation demanded the minimum utopia imaginable. Polish philosopher Bronisław Baksław reminisces that the graffiti on the walls of Paris cried for power to the imagination, a realism that demands the impossible. Moyne's history of human rights, the last utopia, doesn't deny that there is a history. He just argues it's full of dead ends and failures, with new incarnations of rights not being born directly from the last, but from surprising moments of chance and desperation. He points out that the Holocaust and the teleological view of rights don't fit comfortably together. If we adopt a traditional view of linear history, things slowly getting better, then how does the Holocaust fit into this? How does the 80-year-long Soviet Union fit in, the peoples colonised and oppressed for centuries? If the Holocaust wasn't predestined, the end product of an Enlightenment focus on scientific and technological advance, as some have suggested, then the accidental narrative seems much more likely. And so the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 was just as accidental. Moyne has been criticised by some for his cynicism, his rejection of any clear, longer genealogy of rights. But his book brilliantly captures the complexity and messiness of history, something that many historians writing neat narratives fail with. We can see a more optimistic but equally unexpected story in the work of historian Lynn Hunt. We declare these truths to be self-evident, Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1776, words that have been echoed thousands of times since. But if they're self-evident, Hunt asks, then why did this assertion have to be made, and why was it only made in specific times and places? How can human rights be universal if they are not universally recognised? Shall we rest content with the explanation given by the 1948 framers that we agree about the rights but on condition that no one asks us why? Most people probably agree that humans have some kind of rights, but almost no one will be able to tell you why. Philosophers in particular struggle with this question. Hunt's answer is that they are not God-given, logical, universal or accidental, but cultural. To flourish they need a cultural underpinning, and they depend on emotion as much as reason. Once you get down to the philosophic details, rights cannot be strictly rationalised, but are justified on the basis of feelings, convictions, shared assumptions and cultural conformity. She draws upon surprising and convincing evidence to support this. She argues that the rights discourse of the American and French revolutions was the result of a cultural shift over the course of the previous century. A cultural shift in empathy. Empathy requires that we recognise that we are, in some sense, similar. We share feelings, emotions, pains, joys. We have the ability to imagine what it's like for another. She argues that a flourishing of empathetic feeling developed out of a surprising cultural trend in the 18th century. The pop culture of the day, epistolary novels. They were published, usually in serial form, as if they were letters written between characters in the first person. The intimate private nature of the letters that unfolded into a story gave the effect of an unprecedented realism, an immediate and personal glimpse into the lives of other people. And the phenomenon was huge. Hunt argues that they had an immeasurable cultural effect. Just take a look at some of the reviews. Only the cold-hearted could resist these torrents of emotion that so ravaged the soul that so imperiously, so tyrannically extract such bitter tears. Another said they were full of emotions upon emotions, upheavals upon upheavals. Another reported passion, delirium, spasms and sobs. It has witchcraft in every page of it, but it's the witchcraft of passion and meaning. My spirits are strangely seized, my sleep is disturbed, waking in the night I burst into a passion of crying, so I did at breakfast this morning and just now again. I never felt so much distress in my life as I have done for that dear girl. Never have I wept such delicious tears, that reading created such a powerful effect on me that I believe I would have gladly died during that supreme moment. The most famous of these novels, and probably the bestseller of the century, Julie, was written by none other than Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
the populariser of rights talk in France and the sweetheart of the French Revolution. Importantly, and unlike almost everything before it, Julie crossed class lines, sex lines, national lines. It was about humans and their feelings. And novels like this enabled, for the first time, noblemen to empathise with maids, men with women, adults with children. No longer were stories about aristocrats like Don Quixote, but about everyday people. Hunt argues that this created a new psychology, a new way of thinking about others, which even more importantly laid the foundations for a new social and political order. She writes, Can it be coincidental that the three greatest novels of psychological identification of the 18th century Richardson's Pamela in 1740, and Clarissa in 1747-48, and Rousseau's Julie in 1761, were all published in the period that immediately preceded the appearance of the concept of the rights of man. In a letter suggesting a list of books to a friend that included Julie, Thomas All Men Are Created Equally Jefferson wrote that in reading them we find a strong desire in ourselves of doing charitable and grateful acts. So what's the lesson here? Rights, any social movement, has to be fought for on a cultural level, on the terrain of imagination, as Moyne calls it. They're not simply legal, institutional, political, philosophical. They require a cultural underpinning to give them weight. Culture, news, politics, dramas, soaps, novels, music, films don't just describe the world. They produce the world. They create the future. For a certain utopian or even modest rights discourse to flourish, it requires some cultural foundation, some shared understanding that we can all agree on that prevents contention. Epistolary novels provided part of this foundation in the 18th century, so what's the cultural trend that needs to flourish today? The internet was thought to be an emancipatory medium that would usher in an era of shared knowledge and connection, no one expected the explosion of repressed hate that emerged in many bubbles. Maybe the next cultural movement that has a positive effect will need to be a digital one. The digital version of epistolary novels, maybe. So maybe there's more to that moment in the 70s and the years building up to it than we can currently see. It took 200 years for Hunt to make her argument. One thing's for sure. If the future of human rights isn't certain, it certainly has to be fought for. If you want to support Then and Now, then please subscribe below and most importantly, click the bell here to receive notifications when I upload a new video. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram in the links in the description below. And if you're feeling really generous, then this channel only exists through the support of pledges on Patreon, where you can support new content with as little as a dollar for each new video. Thanks for watching. See you next week.